All right, well, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, research and innovation track talk. My name is Richard Wesley. I'm a senior research scientist here at Tableau Software. And I've been concerned with time in analytics for a large part of the time I've been at Tableau. And because this is a research and innovation talk, I want to caution you that I'm not going to be showing you any new features. That's not what this is about. This is about what is the research process for looking into subjects like time. I am going to be showing you some stuff that I think will be helpful, especially if you were at the scaffolding talk yesterday. And I'll get to that in a moment. So part of the whole research process is not so much getting answers as getting questions. You know, figuring out what to do next and what to uh, pass on to my colleagues. Uh, we had some answers in previous days. Uh, they have to have put this slide in there, but it's all in the past. So since this is a talk about time, I figured I'd get the temporal ordering right. <laughs> so our schedule for today, and this looks like a lot of things, but actually they, they compact very well. I want to start off by talking about what is time. Because it's very difficult, I think, for people to think about time sometimes, because it, it's, we're so immersed in it. Right? This is one of the most fundamental things we observe about the universe, is our own perception of the flow of time. And there's a lot of cultural stuff attached to it. And so I want to start right at the beginning. Most of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the theory in databases of how you represent, model, and query time, and the implications that has for how Tableau might interact with the database to improve analytics. So those next three things are actually all pieces of the database piece. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit at the end on a subject I call temporal networks, because there's a set of analytics problems that people think are about time, but which actually turn out to be about networks. And then I'll give a little you know, even more forward-looking stuff and some references at the end. Now, those are the topics. And I also have an untopic. Frequency analytics are a big thing. And one of the visualization types that one can get into with that are these things like frequency domain plots and spectrograms. And these are hard to do in SQL because SQL does not deal well with ordered data. And you need special algorithms, which have to be coded up very precisely for doing things like fast Fourier transforms, fast wavelet transforms, and so forth. And the, the database community is actually interested in this. And I was at an uh, invitation-only seminar last summer where we were talking about how do we get this stuff into SQL. But it's a very new research topic. Uh, and I'm very sympathetic to it because my background is actually in digital signal processing. And we can talk about that later after the session if, you, if you'd like. So fundamentally, what is time? Well, going back to Newton, we've always seen time as a linear thing. And this is the way physics did it, dealt with it for several hundred years, until Einstein came along and uh, suggested that maybe we could have weird things like time-like loops. And Einstein's view of the universe turned it into this thing called a block universe, where the flow of time is assumed to be an illusion. But not every physicist buys this. And there's a guy I'm very fond of, uh, Lee Smolin. And he's not just a random crank. He's the, one of the co-inventors of loop quantum gravity, which is one of the, he's probably the leading uh, alternative to string theory. And I greatly re recommend this book, Time Reborn. Uh, it's very readable. And he goes through the whole process of how did physics come to view time in this particular way. And Smolin makes the point or a good argument that time is not this sort of emergent phenomena, but it's fundamental, and it's sequential, and that the flow of time we experience is not an illusion, but it's real. And a side piece I take out of this is that the future is not determined, which is one of the most hopeful things I know. So that's the way the physicists look at it. But most humans aren't physicists. And human cultures have taken a different approach to time, and they see it often as cyclical. You had harvest seasons, phases of the moon, and you know you look up at the stars, and they always come back to the same place. And in her novel, The Dispossessed, Ursula K. Le Guin 
has a main character who's also a physicist who's concerned with time. And he takes this, this cyclical piece to be more than just a cultural thing, and notices that there are cyclical things in the real world, such as atomic oscillations, the orbits of planets, and so forth. And the physicist's job in this novel is to try and unite these two forms of thinking about time. And that's sort of what I'm going to be trying to do here today. So how is time usually stored or represented? Well, in a database, it's typically a numerical sequence of values. And the fundamental unit is the second, which is a little bit odd, because if you're in Tableau and you convert a time to an integer, you get days. But days are not a very good unit. Really, the fundamental thing under the hood is the second. And it's usually measured as the distance from some epoch at some resolution, like milliseconds. Now, there have been a couple of epochs that show up uh, historically in uh, software. Uh, Unix operating system uses timestamps that are based at the 1st of January 1970. Uh, Microsoft Excel in the 1980s said, well, let's make it January 1st, 1900, except that the people who originally coded it up didn't realize that 1900 wasn't a leap year. So that caused some interesting problems for a number of years. And a final one that's used in a lot of databases these days is Julian days. And sometime in the Renaissance, a guy noticed that we had all these weird cycles, but you could get them all to coincide if you went back far enough. And so that's why that particular epoch is in use a lot. So that's the physical analog of time in a computer. But that's not the way we deal with time a lot of time when we're doing reporting or all kinds of you know, just cultural activities. And we wind up with these incompatible cycles. I mean, you think the year has a certain number of days, but it's actually some weird fraction, and it even varies slightly every year. Months, do they fit into the years? Got moon cycles. There's a lot of calendars, and we'll talk about this in a moment, where the fact that there's almost exactly the right number of weeks, a complete number of weeks in a year, but not quite, causes all kinds of reporting headaches. And we also like to think that days are some kind of fixed thing, but they're not. And this image here, it's a rather beautiful thing, it's called the analemma. And what it, the guy did was he took a picture every day at clock noon of where the sun was. And you'll notice that the sun is wiggling around. That's because the Earth's orbit actually changes the length of the day as you go around the sun. In addition to the cycles, there's also questions of where do things start, okay? And you might think that, oh, if we're just using the Gregorian calendar, everything starts on January 1st. Well, what time zone are you in? This is why we'd like to represent things as seconds, because then you can just pick the right point where your year starts instead of, say, Greenwich Mean Times uh, start. Uh, throughout history, different cultures have used different days for New Year's Day. And there's other calendars, such as the uh, East Asian lunar calendar, where Tet uh, is not the same day every year in the Gregorian calendar. Of course, New Year's Day in Gregorian calendar isn't the same in the, the other calendar. And another place you get different time starts is maybe you're doing very irregular bins, and you're just a, a runner who likes to keep track of when their races start and measure times every time you start a new race. Now, to go through the talk, <coughs> I'd like to stick with some terminology. Uh, this isn't actually stuff I just made up. Most of this is, again, from the literature. <coughs> Excuse me. And the first one is a moment. A moment is a point in time, like now. And a period is a time segment between two moments. So now, and now we have two points, and we have a duration, which is the length of the time between. So those are the physical terms. The cultural terms start with a calendar. And you, the best way to think of a calendar is as a binning system for time. Okay, so you have a Gregorian calendar in Pacific Standard Time. And within a calendar, you have a number of other pieces. Each of the bins has a name. 
So for example, you could have a month, and I call that a part name. And a lot of these are also the same terms that we use in our calculations language. A date part is a value in a particular calendar bin. So like June or six if you're taking the numerical version. A time hierarchy is a set of nested parts. So you have a year and then the, the months fit exactly inside a year and then the days fit exactly inside a month. And an interval, and this is the term the databases use, which is why I'm using it, is a relative time change inside of a calendar. If I say two months from now, you don't know how many seconds that is because it depends when now is. Okay, so an interval is a different thing from a duration. Okay. One other thing that I looked at while I was doing all this work was week-based calendars. I mean, we're used to Gregorian, but one of the most common calendars we've run into with customers are these week-based calendars and this is to deal with this problem of there's almost the right number of weeks in a year. And there's a couple of different systems that have been proposed. The European ISO 8601 calendar is one example. And there's these things called 445 or 454 uh, cor uh, sales calendars or corporate calendars that do similar things. Turns out that uh, you can go and describe all of these calendar this family of calendars with just a few variables. And this is one of the first findings I'm hoping to push down into the product at some point, that instead of just saying, is this a Gregorian calendar or ISO, we can just do all of these different week-based calendars. So that's the, the, the first finding. So my question to the rest of uh, my team is, how do you go about presenting this to the user and so forth? So that's the background on time. And now we're going to talk about the, the fundamental idea in databases, which is a state table. This is not a state as in a state of the United States, but a state of an object. And the Bible for this particular kind of work is by Professor Richard Snodgrass, Developing Time-Oriented Database Applications in SQL. I follow Professor Snodgrass pretty slavishly because he's been doing this uh, and writing books about it pretty much since before I hit puberty, and I'm not that young. So a basic component in databases for doing proper time modeling is a state table. And it consists of four abstract pieces. You have some entity, which could be described by one or more columns. You have a property, which could again be described by one or more columns. And then you have a begin time and an end time. So that means that using our earlier terminology, each row contains a period. Okay? And there are two standard operations that you can do with these kinds of tables, which will cover most operations, complex operations you want to do with time. And those are moment in period and period intersection. Now before I explain what those are, we have to do a little bit of grubby housekeeping. There's this problem in these representations uh, about what do the begin and end mean? What are the boundary conventions? And the one that works best, and in the math is simplest for, is called closed open. And the reason this works best is because it helps you avoid what are called fence post errors. And I could have just put any random fence post up, picture up there to illustrate it. it. Turns out that this was from an article on the Julian calendar where this turned out to be more than just uh, an abstract idea. Now, if you look at the diagram or the, the drawing, you've got a leap year and a leap year, and there's two staves between it and three gaps. What happened when Julius Caesar invented the original Julian calendar, on which the Gregorian is based, he's, he, the way he described it was a little vague. And what happened was, he instituted it, uh, the first year that it was fully in operation was the year he got assassinated. <laughs> so he wasn't around to explain what was wrong. And so for the few, three, first few years, they read it that there should be a leap year every three years. Finally, after Augustus had subdued the second triumvirate, he looked at this and realized it was wrong and fixed it all up and decided that uh, he'd done such a good job he would name a month after himself. 
Now, this closed open convention happens naturally in some data, and hotel reservations are a prime example. You check in on one day, you check out on the other, you subtract those two days, and you can find out exactly how many nights you stayed. But there's some data that is, uses a closed, closed convention. And this is like employee work dates is the place I see this the most. You have a hire date and their uh, resignation date, okay? But the thing about that is that both of those days they were working. And if you subtract the difference between them, you'll be off by one, which is our friend the fence post error. Last piece of housekeeping is sometimes you run into situations where you have something unbounded. So for example, I'm still working at Tableau. What do you put in my end date column? You could put null. You could put a far future date. People tend to put the, use the far future date one when the column has been said set to be not null, so you gotta do something. But that can be, cause some interesting problems when you're trying to do uh, various calculations in the database. And generally what you have to do in that situation is check for that situation and uh, just clamp it to today or now. So let's get back to our fundamental operations. Moment and period. A canonical question here is, how many employees did we have on the 1st of January every year? To answer this question properly, we need a year table, and we need to do this kind of intersection query that you see here. And the way it looks is a, in a picture over on the right is you have the, the years, the January 1st is up the top there, and the dotted lines are where you're going to intersect, and each line there is an employee's hire and fire dates. So if you do this query, you will wind up with the answer you want. And the question to ask now for the rest of the teams, the research question is, how do we get users to specify this naturally? And how, do we, how does Tableau know how to, gen to, to generate this funky join that's in here? If you look at this join, you'll see that it's got a couple of less than or equal to and less than signs in it. And we don't generally do that in the main interface. So this is why you see a lot of temporal analytics being done these days in Tableau with Tableau prep to build a, data, a specific data set for the question or maybe in the connection pane. Okay? And part of what I've been trying to do is help us get away from that and figure out what it is that we need to do. So that's moment and period. The other one is period intersections. How many calendar days did each employee work per calendar year? And for that, we need a year state table to go along with the employee state table. And one of the cool things about these state tables is that when you intersect them, you end up with another state table. So if you look at this query in the middle, I'm sorry, I was thinking I should have highlighted this. Between the from and the second to last line there just before the group by, you see what the intersection query in general looks like. You have a where clause where you have each of them's begin less than the other one's end. That tells you that they that the periods overlap. And then you take the largest of the begins and the smallest of the ends, and that gives you a new period where both facts are true. And then you, we get the employee ID and their year. And once we have that state table, we can then count how many days there are per year by just doing, you know, select the year and the employee ID and then the sum of the difference of how big is the period. Now, yesterday I was watching the scaffolding talk and they were doing a very similar thing with um, devices in a house that were reporting their times on and times off and so forth. And unfortunately they did a calculation that involved a lot of, well, when we have whole days and when we don't. And that was because they had this scaffolding table that only had one column. The right way to do this is to have two columns, one of which is the beginning of the day and the end of the day. And then you write a query like this and it all just falls out. 
So this is the power of the, these kinds of you know, academic research. Okay. But once again, this is all, you know, this is something you would still have to do in the prep or in the connection pane. You can do it, and hopefully this will make some people's lives easier, but we still have to figure out how to connect this to Tableau. And I have a couple of ideas along these lines. Uh, we have this thing right now where we can say that a column is a state table or a country table, and we get automatic geocoding. And we can use the system behind, that's behind that to, you can extend that to do this kind of thing. Another fun one is to define a new type of field, like we have right now shape field columns or shape columns. And maybe we could do something I call a period field, where you pick two columns that are the beginning and the end, and you treat them as a unit. And then you've got this, this thing that you can then start naturally doing intersections with. And Tableau will also allow you to compute these fields if they don't already exist, using our basic calculations language. Now, one of the things I think is pretty cool about having time and intersections is it's very similar to what Tableau already does. You can think about the shelves where you drag out pills as being kind of and operations. So if you've got a mark and, and you have several fields in play, you'll know that this mark is in the US in March you know, and uh, in a particular product category. So those are all and operations. And by doing these, having these temporal periods or something involved, that's another and operation. Intersection is another form of anding. But to do this, we're going to need some other tooling. Uh, how do we provide all these domains? How do we infer intersections from fields that are in play? So that's the Tableau side of it. But I've been skipping over another piece, which is the database side. Uh, how many of you have actually tried to do that kind of intersection query on a lot of data? Yeah. It's really slow, isn't it? It's painfully slow. In fact, it may even time out. Up till recently, the database community has not done a lot of work on this problem. But the last couple of years, there have been a couple of papers uh, where which have started to address this, this problem and come up with some much faster algorithms for doing these kind of overlap or intersection joins. One I uh, highly recommend at least reading the first section of, because it's a hilarious story of that kind, uh, is Kaya and friends, uh, lightning fast and space efficient inequality joins. Just have to read the section one. It's this sob story. More recently, there's another one that's this forward uh, plane sweep algorithm. And that one is usable in a more narrow set of circumstances that turns out to be a little faster for uh, some things, including the kind of temporal queries we have. And since what I really am uh, in real life is a database researcher, I went and did some experiments on this, so you can just sort of see the performance gains. Uh, I would caution you that the vertical axis here is a log scale, because it has to be, because it's so slow. And I went and put this all into the Tableau data engine, which was our previous extract engine, and I was the back-end engineer for that originally. And you can see that the way that the performance is pretty horrible for the original implementation. That's the red line up there. The x-axis is the number of cores I'm applying to the problem. It goes all the way up to 24. With 24 cores, we get down to about 15 seconds for this test query, which has about 6 million periods intersecting 2,500 moments. I then went and did it in Hyper, which was not yet shipping at the time I did the experiments, and found that even it was only twice as fast. And the reason for this is that until we have these new algorithms, the way you had to do these kind of overlap joins was you had to match every row against every other row and see whether it passed. These algorithms avoid doing a lot of that work. So when I went and implemented this, it turns out that it runs in one second instead of 15. And that's 15 times faster. And then when I went in and implemented the second planar sweep, which actually applies in this situation, we got another 10%. So this is looking very good for us to be able to do these kinds of queries and do them in a performant manner. So this is great. This is the foundations. And it looks like we could do it if we could 
figure out the Tableau interface piece. But another part is where do you get these year tables from? And there's a lot of terminology that gets thrown around, and it all seems to be very repetitious. So I have picked a couple of Greek words. And I have a friend who teaches classics, and he has blessed this, these usages. The first one is kairos. And this means the opportune time, the just time, the appropriate time to do something. And I've adopted it to mean important moments. And the thing about important moments is that they are in your data. You take all your time columns, squish them together into one big column, remove the duplicates, and those are the times when things happened. Okay? Well, you can also get a few from the viz. Like if you have some parameters or something, you can throw those in the pile too. But then you get a big list of when things happened. And those are the only times you really need to look at things. It's the only time something can change. The other term is chronos, and this is flowing time. This is more like the physical time we were talking about earlier. And this is linear, it's, things go in sequence, and this is the kind of thing that we would bin and to create cycles. But time is infinite in one direction and possibly in the other, so we need to restrict that a little bit to what we call the temporal domain of discourse. And we can get that from the Kairos data, because that has the first and last time that we actually care about in our data. And when we have this type of time, we then can bin it into these state tables I was talking about. So for example, you could have a month state table that was binned, and then you have, would have a row for June, have a name of six, value of, well, sorry, name of June, value of six, begins on June 1st, ends on July 1st, remember, closed open. There's also a fun thing about these generated tables, which is useful to me as a database person, is that they are sorted and the rows don't overlap. So there may be some interesting opportunities to make things even faster. But you don't have to stick to simple state tables like this. You can do more complicated things with what I call time travel. And the idea here is that you want to perform the same analysis at different moments in time. So suppose we had a table of contracts. Okay? They have a start date and a duration. And you want to know, say in February here, what is three months forward revenue? Well, you would filter the table down, do a little calculation to add up all the money you're going to get in that time period, and you're done. So that's one value. Suppose you want it for every month for the next two years. The way you can do that is that you create another state table which has three month bands in it. Now in the diagram here, the original data is in the top there in red. Okay, you've got all of these contracts, when they start and how long they go for. The bands that you see going down are three month periods that are in another state table. So now when you do a cross join between these two, you wind up duplicating all of the contracts. But since you're going to intersect them with these periods, you can do the same analysis you did for one value for all of them. Okay? So these overlap joins create multiple copies of the data. And this would be really cool to be able to do up in Tableau, but again, how do we go about specifying this? I think a lot of these questions about how do we specify this are actually almost the same questions. So I'm, I'm sort of optimistic about that. Now, Kronos and Kairos are great, but we might want to store them and reuse them. And if you were doing this with geography, you wouldn't have a problem. You'd just make some shapefiles. Well, it might be hard to make shapefiles, but you know, there's a mechanism for doing this. But the thing is, time is a lot like geography. Okay, you have a moment, corresponds to a location. A period corresponds to a polygon or a shape. A part name corresponds to a geopolitical label. You know, so you have a year corresponds to the United States or something. 
Time hierarchies are just like geopolitical hierarchies. You've got a country, you've got a state, you've got a city, you've got a street, and so forth. So this suggests to me that we should be able to define a standard, at least in Tableau, for calendar files that correspond to shape files. Now, maybe this seems like overkill for you, but the thing is, a number of people, a number of customers, big customers especially, already have to do this because they operate across national boundaries and they have different holidays in different countries. They may have reporting policies that have been encoded into these kinds of calendar tables. So in order to get what customers are already doing into Tableau, we need to have a common way of talking about this data and possibly importing it and shaping, you know, squishing it around a little bit. So here's a proposed calendar schema that I have investigated and verified that we can do everything we would need to do. Uh, the important parts are you have a part and a begin and an end. This is months, but it's also only the months from 2018. Okay, this table would keep going for years in either direction. You can also have names, although we might want to pull those out so that you can localize them. And what I found, though, is that we can do all of Tableau's date operations using tables like this. So if you have your date part function, which is one of the binning functions, that corresponds to just pulling out, finding the date in the range and then pulling out the part number. If you want to truncate the date to that period, you find it again, and then you pull out the begin column. And if you want the part name, you just go there and pull out the name. So that's not so bad, but it turns out you can also do all of the arithmetic functions, like date add and date diff. Uh, you haven't heard of date sub, because it's one I've proposed, that, uh, and if you like it, please go vote for it somewhere. And that is, if you have a baby who's born in December, and then you check, have a checkup in January, how old is the baby? Well, if you say date diff, the way date diff works is it counts the number of period boundaries you cross. So it'll tell you the baby's one year old. Date sub is one that will do that differently and tell you that it, no, it's not one year. So, uh, but I verified that we can also do that with these calendars. We may need locales. The other piece of grubbiness is we'll need to be able to hook the month and the year together when they nest and so forth. So we could generate, we could store these tables or we might want to generate them on the fly. And so a technology that will help us do that, technology is it's maybe an overkill word here. Uh, Hyper inherited from Postgres a command called create sequence. And you can use this to create date and time tables. Uh, I'm not sure if the Hyper API will let you do this, but this is one way you could go about potentially creating tables, time tables at various resolutions. Uh, keeping track of the sorted tables may help us uh, do some performance optimizations. And one of the nice things about Tableau having an extract file format is that that's a great candidate to use to make these calendar files. And we still have the question of how do we connect these new things up to Tableau. Well, we already have these columns called things like latitude generated and longitude generated. We could also have calendar generated type columns. And we could get these by looking at the user's data, and we can generate the Kairos data by just looking, taking the union of all their time columns. And then we can generate the Kronos data by saying, okay, what's the range on the Kairos data, and then how, what's the resolution on it? Okay. My personal favorite for a way to approach some of this stuff is this thing I was describing earlier called period fields. So these temporal columns we have already in your data, they tend to describe something called um, an event table. Right? Which we'll get to in a moment. The period fields then go and convert your event table to a state table. And if you had several of these, you could drag them out. They would overlap, like using that query that I showed you. And if you dragged out a date column and a period column, that would generate a moment in period query. And if you drag out two period fields, you would get, generate a period intersection query. 
So I keep talking about event tables. What are event tables? Event tables are less capable, but they show up a lot. And the problem that kind of got me into all of this was something that our globetrotting product manager, Bethany Lyons, ran into a couple of years ago. Bethany was living in the UK, even though she was not a UK citizen, and which meant that she had to apply for a residence visa on a regular basis. So she thought, oh, I'll just use Tableau for this. But she didn't have very good records. What she had was her passport. She said, all right, I'll just go make a spreadsheet and stick in all of the stamp dates from my, from my passport. And then I can do this thing where I have to prove to the home office that I haven't been out of the country for more than, what is it, 180 days in the last five years. And it'll be great. And it was this huge saga involving a whole bunch of stuff in prep and everywhere else. And the first, so she went and did all this stuff. And so I started having a look at the problem. I realized that part of the, you know, the fundamental problem she had was that she had an event table here, which only has one date in it. What she really needed was a state table. And fortunately, it's pretty easy to convert them. Okay. The way you do it is you have, you just have to sort the data by time and then copy the column and shift it up. Okay. Because the state transitions are dense. You're either here or there. You're either awake or asleep. Okay. So if you look at this query here, you'll notice that it has an over clause in it. You, and a function called lead, partition by entity, order by time. How many people have used SQL analytic functions? Yeah. So this is how you convert an event table to a state table. It's already standard SQL. It's been around for 15 years. There is a question about how fast it is, though. And fortunately, some of the leading work on this has been done by the hypergroup. And uh, this was a paper published a couple of years ago, and the other databases are starting to adopt it. So now this whole windowing process that you would use is becoming widely available. The other interesting piece, though, is that that query is essentially a table calculation. So that fun the, the SQL function lead is a, roughly equivalent to the table calculation function lookup. And the trouble is, that Tableau does not, it computes all of those things after the database. So what we really need to be able to do is execute table calculations in the database. And a couple of years ago, I did a proof of concept project on this with some people. And we've sort of demonstrated that you can do it. But again, we need to start integrating it in there. I'm hoping that the object model, which was described in the keynote, will help us get to that point. <laughs> I know, it would be lovely. All right, so that's the, the main part of uh, the, the database piece here. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk about these things called temporal networks. This is another problem I got from Bethany, and uh, she thought it was a time problem, and I looked at it for a while and realized that actually, no, it's a network problem. So what does this kind of problem look like? Well based on something called a temporal cohort. This is a group of things, people, that share an event in a single time period. So like if you're a TV network and you want to check uh, viewer retention, you might look at it on a weekly basis because you kind of have a weekly schedule. You know, how if people watch this week, did they come back the following week? And what you really want to do is count the number of people who stuck around from week to week to week. And this sounds like temporal analytics because it's got the word weak in it, but it isn't, <laughs> okay? This is really a network problem, and the way you construct the network is that the weak bins are the nodes in this network. The users that are shared between two nodes are the links between the nodes, and the number of distinct users is the strength of the connection between two nodes. So you could do this with the query that I've got down below, which is just a self-join between the viewers. 
And the thing to notice here is that the where clause has an equality in it. User equals user. And then it's got a week less than week. Now you might say, oh, you need some fancy database algorithm for this, but you don't actually, beca usually, because that equality is something people have known how to do really fast for like over 20 years. It's called a hash join for the nerdy among you. And so what you would do is you would just join those two columns together and then do a little filtering on the, on the end. And that would be a lot faster than anything else. So this means that there's no new database technology that's needed. But the reason you can do this so easily in Tableau today, easily, is that time is what's called a, quantit a qualitative dimension. A quantitative dimension. Sorry, getting a little late. A quantitative dimension. Quantitative means that it has a distance operation that works. That, that's the, the real formal definition of it. And so, and dimension means it's an independent variable. So time has this somewhat unique property. And that means that you can lay it out in a viz by mapping the distances between bits of, between these nodes to position in a grid. So over on the left here, we have the actual network laid out using Tableau, but we can, we're just, you've got the dates down the, the uh, left-hand side, and then the number of weeks out uh, along the top. And so that's the way of drawing this network, even though it's based on time. But you could use this for any uh, kind of quantitative dimension, or even if you just had um, just a, uh, the word begins with a C, categorical dimension, if you just had an ordering there, you could still get it to lay out. All right, so now what? Well, to sum up, temporal analytics of the complexity we would like needs support from both Tableau and the underlying database. Tableau needs to define some affordances like period fields or something like that or uh, semantic roles or something, and it needs table calculation, analytic function push down, which means you push it down from Tableau into the database. The databases need efficient implementations of, of these analytic functions and inequality joins. Now the database piece is largely done, okay? Windowing's in most databases and it's even fast in some of them. Uh, not so, inequality joins are a newer thing, but um, one of the things I'm actually doing right now is hacking them into hyper. The Tableau experience, though, still needs some work. So if this sort of thing interests you, please let the, the, the analytics team know this, the, your sales reps or whoever. Uh, we got a bunch of pieces there. We got to know how to model these state tables effectively in the interface, and then generate the joins. And we're also gonna need some form and standard for calendar tables. Future stuff I might be doing, uh, there's various inefficiency or various efficiencies that might be gained from sneakily looking at the data. And there's some other fuzzy stuff. Uh, there's other kinds of joins that do this kind of not quite matching thing. And then getting uh, this into hyper. It turns out to be a, a new kind of operator for the nerdy among you. And that's, um, that's something they haven't done before. So we're having a lot of fun with that. Another weird piece about time is that time and space interact. Maps are time dependent. You know, whether South Sudan exists depending on what year you're talking about. And calendars are also space dependent. You know, whether something's a holiday depends on what country you're looking at. So how do we help users manage this, this expectation? I mean, there's even more fundamental ones like people used to try and parse dates by strings by pulling them apart and then concatenating them in uh, US locale formats. And then where their uh, colleague in Europe opens it up, the dates don't work. So it's a lot of stuff like that. There's also some re interesting related topics. So I talked a bit about quantitative dimensions. And these show up in some other places like in you can have synthetic space-time, you call it, in like video games where 
where you are in the game is your spatial direction, how long you've been playing is time. Uh, sporting events, the physical stuff is, the spatial part is real, but the temporal part is uh, the game clock. And you can even get weird things like football has times when the clock doesn't move, but things still happen. And soccer has things where they pull the clock back, and so something, can, two different things can happen at the same time. Uh, you've also got interesting problems around tracking events flowing through networks, you know, like tracking where people go in websites or how people flow through wards in a hospital. Now, the inequality joint, the first inequality joint paper I showed you uh, actually wasn't about time. It was about something completely different. The analytic task they were talking about, if I'm remembering right, was figuring out things like you have some employees and one of them makes more than another but somehow paid less in taxes. Okay, so you want to find pairs of people where their salary and their, their tax burden are not the same, hook them up, figure out what one person did, and then hook the other person up with a tax advisor or something like that. Okay, there's another one they had about so figuring out the differences between uh, costing between East and West Coast uh, cloud systems. So there's those types of things you can do with these overlap joins. Another one, though, is often connections between data sets are fuzzy, and so you want to be able to join them together by overlapping things that are similar to each other. So being able to do this sort of ad hoc exploration of overlap relationships. And windowing is also useful for doing this kind of event sequence analysis I was talking about for hospitals and websites. Uh, the only problem is that the SQL Standards Committee is figuring this out right now, and they've come up with a syntax that only a COBOL programmer could love, but I think we're going to be stuck with it. And that's just about all I have. Here's some uh, references to the literature if you feel like really getting deep into it. Um, I should say that these slides will be available for download as soon as everything gets together, uh, as soon as our, our uh, people who are doing the, the conference for us are organizing that sort of thing. So this will be available. You can, if you have to read it on the plane home, please feel free to take a picture. And that brings me to the end, and uh, please complete the uh, session survey in the mobile app. Reminder. And thank you, and I can take questions now.